celebration of black history. As you all know, our mission here at the Alamo Colleges is to empower for success. And what better way to empower diverse communities than by celebrating our diversity and celebrating the contributions that all of our diverse cultures here in San Antonio and Texas across the United States have made for um, education and for the betterment and empowerment of people. And that's exactly what we do here. We ensure that we can provide economic for the people that we serve, um, and in doing so, really making an impact on the greater community of San Antonio. And so again, I'd like to thank you all for being here. I want to recognize our board members who are here. Um, Joe Jesse Sanchez. <laughs> I just want to, I want to thank you, Christy, very much. Uh, I want to thank Valerie. Thank you, Valerie. And my remarks, uh, it says here to welcome everybody to our celebration. Friends, right? Um, and in particular, for our inaugural effort here, um, we celebrate and recognize the contributions that individuals have made. Individuals of African descent. Fortunate that uh, hundred and twenty two years of history. And, um, and a mission to empower our diverse communities for success. And so that's why we're here. This is fantastic because it just comes from conversations and feedback from Dr. Saunders and, and team uh, within Staff Senate, uh, and then with everybody coming together. And so I'm supposed to turn over the mic to Valerie? Yes. Yes, I am. <laughs> so I'll stop talking because we got some exciting things to do this afternoon, don't we? Yes. All right. Thank you all very much. Welcome. for this first celebration. Uh, there's so much that we're going to uh, partake of today. Um, Dr. Flores has welcomed us. We have Dr. Rayleigh, the Vice Chancellor of Academics. Originally, this was supposed to be outside in the amphitheater, indicative to when the speech was originally to go ahead and give us the occasion and then It's good that we um, have events like this uh, to remember from whence we came. Uh, we must always remember our past, know your history, understand why you are and who you are, so you can understand where you're going next. I thought about what comments I was going to make today, and I knew there were going to be some students here. Did you know this uh, <laughs> for, for you all? So agriculture, as we know, Many people of color contrib contributed to what makes this country great. Not just African American, but many people of color. But unfortunately, they're missing in our history books. Certainly my own personal experience, taking history, uh, there were no African Americans in the textbook at all, we didn't see them. 
but through learning your history and doing your own research, you can learn a great deal about how everyone in our culture contributed to making this the greatest country in the world. So the first, did you know, this is agriculture. So born in 1807, did you know Henry Blair invented the corn planter and the cotton planter, greatly increasing the efficiency of farming and return on investment and production in farming. It was also the first to receive patent in the United States. Inoculation, the measles and an African slave introduced the concept of inoculation to the United States. It comes from an old tradition in Africa, centuries old tradition, extracting material from infected persons and scratching the skin of an uninfected person, thereby introducing the disease to that person, causing them to uh, create a resistance. And so as a result, uh, this tradition was used to inoculate American soldiers during the Revolutionary War and also spread the concept of inoculation in the United States. How many of you have seen cowboy shows? See many African Americans in them? No. They were very active, very instrumental in the West and working in, uh, as cowboys. It's a big industry in this country for quite, a, quite some time. Probably no one realizes for cowboys, many of them were black. Despite stories told popular books and movies, in fact, it's believed that the real Lone Ranger was inspired by an African The master of the guys, expert marksman, had a Native American <coughs> companion and rode a silver horse. their own fellow officers. Many years ago, during my lifetime, my hair is gray now, it's falling out. <laughs> 50 years ago or so, Dr. Martin Luther King, Martin Luther King, led hundreds of Americans on the march from Selma to Montgomery, Alabama. I watched that on TV, our black and white TV, which had three channels, by the way. And so in the evening, I saw what was happening in the South as I lived in the South in Kentucky. And so to be a personal witness, to see what was happening on the evening news, I was eight years old, you know, not much, you know, render, not much uh, uh, you all here. And to come home from school and see people who look like you go through on the evening news and they were just marching for the right to vote. Just to be a participant in the American democracy. As a result of that march, eventually Congress passed the historic voting rights. your generation for the generations to follow. So you are the most important treasure that we have in this country. This amount of education you can hold because education is power. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wayne with the students from the George Gervin Youth Center for today's celebration. The students, uh, the center is not just for youth, it's a resource for the entire community. 
from a pre-K through high school academic academy to retirement housing something for everyone within their walls. Their mission is to provide innovative pathways that motivate today's student to become tomorrow's leaders as we became the catalyst for equity, fairness, and inclusion. Today we have 10 children who will recite this famous speech accompanied by Dr. Mitchell. Listen to Dr. King's speech that is relevant today as it was when it was originally spoken on August 28, 1963. Dr. Mitchell. I'm going to do the portions of the Dr. King's speech in his voice with his mannerisms. So uh, some people say if you close your eyes, you can almost think he's here. Um, and uh, so I'm going to give you the introduction to the speech. It was 100 years after this uh, Emancipation Proclamation had been passed. This is the reason why 1963 was chosen to say, where, where have we gone? What has happened? What have we done in the last 100 years to advance equality? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to begin the speech as Dr. King did, again, in his voice, and then I'm gonna turn it over to the kids, and they're gonna continue the speech, and then when they're done, I'm gonna come back and conclude the speech in Dr. King's voice as well, okay? I'm happy to be here with you today for what will go down in history as the greatest demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation. Five score years ago, a great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today, signed the Emancipation Proclamation. This momentous decree came as a great beacon light of hope to millions of Negro slaves who had been seared in the flames of withering injustice. But 100 years later, the Negro finds himself in the midst of a lonely island of poverty in a vast ocean of material prosperity. 100 years later, the Negro still finds himself languished in the corners of American society and exiled in his own land. 100 years later, the Negro I also come to the total spots of modern America of the fierce urgency of now. This is no time to engage in the luxury of cooling off to take the tranquilizing joy of graduating. Now is the time to make real promises of democracy. Now is the time to rise from the dark and desolate the valley of segregation to the selfless path of racial justice. Now is the time to lift our nation from the quicksands of racial injustice to the solid rock of brotherhood. Now is the time to make justice a reality for all God's children. My name is Jeremy Williams, and my dream is to one day become the entrepreneur's best CEO. But there's something that I must say to my people who stand on the warm threshold which leads into the palace of justice. In the process of gaining our rightful place, we must not be guilty of wrong. Great protests to, 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 to degenerate into physical violence again and again. We must rise 
to the majestic heights of meeting physical force with soul force. My name is Alexis Obisay, and my dream is to one day become an author. And as we walk, we must make the pledge that we shall always march ahead. We cannot turn back. There are those who are asking the devotees of civil rights, when will we be satisfied? We can never be satisfied as long as the Negro is the victim of the unspeakable horrors of police brutality. We cannot be satisfied as long as the Negro's basic mobility is from a smaller ghetto to a larger one. No, no. <coughs> we are not satisfied and we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. My name is Elisha Payne and my dream is to one day become a criminal investigator slash kinesiology teacher. I am Madam Michael that some of you have come here out of great trials and tribulations. Some of you have come fresh from narrow jail cells, and some of you have come from areas where your quest, quest for freedom has been battered by the storms of persecution and spared by the river of police brutality. You have been the veteran of pain and suffering. Continue to work with the faith that I know suffering is easy and pure. Today, my friends, and even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. Behold these I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day in the state of Mississippi, Or when they live in a nation, but they will not be judged by the color of their skin or by the content of their character. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day, down in Alabama, with its vicious racist, with its governor having his lips stripping with the words of interposition and nullification, one day, right there in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. My name is Elaine Hubbard, and my dream is to one day become a music producer. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day every, ba every valley shall be exalted, and every hill and mountain shall be lowered. The rough places will be made plain, and the crooked places will be made straight. And the glory of our Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. This is our hope. In this faith, that I go back to the South Bay. With this faith, we will be able to heal out all the mountains of despair and the stone of hope. With this faith, we'll be able to transfer all the buildings. Together, struggle together, go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that one day we'll be free. My name is Abrea Mosley, and my dream is to become a registered nurse. I have a dream. And if America is to be a great nation, this must become true. And so let freedom ring from the prettiest hilltops of New Hampshire. Let freedom ring from the, from the mighty mountains of New, New York. Let freedom ring from the high ning allegiance of Pennsylvania. Let freedom ring from the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado. Let freedom ring from the curvaceous slopes of California. But not only that, let freedom ring from the stone mountain of Georgia. Let freedom ring from Lookout Mountain of Tennessee. Let freedom ring from every hill and molehill of Mississippi. From every mountainside, let freedom ring. My name is Christoph Williams, and my dream. And freedom, freedom to ring. Will we let it ring from every village, every hamlet, from every state, and every city? 
We'll be able to speak up that day when all of us, God children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual. Free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty. One day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day Down in Mississippi, things will be changed. Our little children will live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. Alabama with its vicious racist, with its governor having his lips dripping with the words of interposition and notification. One day right there in Alabama, little black girls and black boys will join hands with white girls and white boys and walk together as brothers and sisters. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted. Every hill and every mountain will be made low, and the crooked places will be made straight, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. And this will be the day, this will be the day when all of God's children will sing with new meaning, my country tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where our fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride. From every mountainside, let freedom ring. And this, if this is to happen, then this must become true. So let freedom ring from the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire. Let freedom ring from the mighty mountains of New York. Let freedom ring from the heightening Alleghenies of Pennsylvania. But not only that, let freedom ring from Lookout Mountain and Sea. Let freedom ring from every hill and every molehill of Mississippi. From every mountainside, let freedom ring. And when this happens, when we allow freedom to ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day with all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholic will be able to join hands and sing with the Negro in that old spiritual law. Free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, I'm free at last. Now I want to say one more thing to you before I take my seat. Every now and then I think about my own death. And I think about my own funeral and I don't think of it anymore. What is it that I would want said, and I'll leave the word with you this morning. If any of you are around when I have to meet my day, I don't want a long funeral. You get somebody to deliver the eulogy, tell them not to talk too long. <laughs> tell them not to mention a no peace prize. That's not important. Tell them not to mention that I have three or four hundred other awards. That's not important. Don't even tell them where I went to school. 
I want somebody to say that day that Martin Luther King Jr. tried to give his life serving others. I want you to be able to say that I did try. I want you to I won't have any money to leave behind. I won't have the fine and luxurious things of the world to leave behind. But I just want to leave a committed life behind. Yes, if you want to say that I was a drum major, say that I was a drum major for peace. I was a drum major for justice. And all of these other shallow things will not matter. Yes, if I can help somebody as I travel along, then my living will not be in vain. Yes, I want to help somebody. And yes, I want to leave this world a better place than what it was before I came to make of this old world a new world. May God bless you. Thank you. So as we reflect on the speech, thank you to the Gurman students, thank you Dr. Mitchell and all who are here. I want to acknowledge uh, Mr. Jose Macias Jr., our Board of Trustee, who's over in the corner, he just joined us. We have some seating over here for you, so thank you for coming out. Um, we invite you, beginning with our students, to a taste of soul as we move to the second part of, of this celebration today. Uh, prepared by Chef Don and his team. We have a taste of soul food over there. So we're going to ask the children first. Uh, to Some of them wanted that instead of Chick-fil-A. So, <laughs> <laughs> so go ahead, we'll have the children serve first. And then I'm going to introduce our next speaker. Uh, we invite you to stick around. Uh, we have Miss Sandra thomas Oak, who's going to give us a history. Uh, she Black Greek organization, but what she will share with us is how we create stories. For African Americans to go away to college. So as we begin to further education, we know that we all have a similar past of some kind of oppression or struggle uh, to earn higher education. And so she's just going to give us a, a little bit of history. Ms. Sandra Thomas, oh, if you would. First of all, to the Alabama Community College District uh, Chancellor, officials, administration, faculty, and staff, and invited guests, good day. And I'd like to take a point of uh, privilege right now to congratulate uh, Reverend Dr. Mitchell and the students here uh, for an awesome job. Kudos to the parents and the teachers. You guys did an excellent job. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on behalf of the National County Council and the San Antonio Chapter President, Mrs. Gwendolyn Okundo, who is already incorporated, I bring you greetings and thank you for inviting us to be a part of this celebratory occasion. My name is Sandra Thomas G. Badu, African origin, the historian of the local chapter of the NPHC, or Divine Nine, as we are officially called, and a member, my member of Sigma Gamma Rose Sorority Inc. My duty today is to highlight who and what is the National Penalty Council, its purpose, and its role in African American history. Before going any further, I'd like to ask some
past me, Mrs. Faye Bryant. She was the first. The NBAC was founded in May 10th, 1930, at Howard University. However, many of the organizations were founded earlier in the 20th century, before that time. Black International Greek Letter Fraternities and Sororities. These organizations involved as a group of being denied essential rights and privileges afforded other college students during the 20th century. During that time, many students who went to school, especially a lot of the male students who did not go to HBCUs, had to have their, took their class outside of the classroom. They were not able to sit in with their counterparts, and they had to sit outside and listen to their lecture outside of the doors at that time. And even in some of the other schools, only you know, 12 African Americans were allowed to be in those schools at that time. The organization's stated purpose and mission they are, and some of the people that are famous, I have to do a little bragging because I didn't get a chance to see Martin Luther King sitting in charge before he passed. He was Major Anderson coming. The next organization, which is the AIA, was the first to hold with. is the oldest um, black Greek letter sorority in the world. Coretta Scott King Smith, Rosa Parks, Alicia Keys, young folk, Alicia, <laughs> Alicia Richard, my favorite, and Dr. Maya Angelou were all AKs and are still. The next organization that was founded was Kappa Alpha Psi in 1911 at Indiana University. And some of the famous Kappas are Cedric the Entertainer, Montel Gordon, Marvin Sapp. Then along came Omega Sapp. Then along came Steve Harvey, Tim Jordan. Dal Deltas or Aretha Franklin, Keisha and I pull them, Barbara and Jordan, Angela Bissette, and Natalie Cook. Her name was Dr. Marty. Founders of Delta Signal. And Howard University. And William.
Walter, Shirley Wood from the top, <laughs> Dion Warwick, Tawanda Braxton, and Zora Neale Hurston. Then in 1922, came Sigma White institution. At that time, only 10 people could be allowed of color in the school. Seven of them were Sigma Gamma Rose. They were all school teachers receiving their master's degree. And so at nighttime, when they had to go to school, the Catholics would come over and walk into class because we lived in the same city. We were also found across the street. We lived across the street from the Ku Klux Klan. And the first Academy Awards uh, recipient was had And then I would have thought they was going to find it at Morgan State University in 1963. And since a Christian from the is and discuss how. And it was uh, organized by the Five Eight Sigma fraternity for the Uh, Alpha Phi Alpha has two chapters here. See their new chapter of AKZ, Alamo City T Roses. So we got nine or four. We started in 1972, they were founded in the 30s and 40s. But at that time, they decided to, to get together. And some of the founding members are still living. A lot of you may know Brother Clarence Hill from Omega. The charter members. The Leonidas Watson Center is named by one of the Greeks at St. Philip's. It's named behind an MPH member. Uh, another person that was a member, uh, charter member that's now. DST and he was like, out. So we still have a few charter members living. I'm PhD right now, that's the reason why they call me the historian because I've been a member, <laughs> I've been a member since 1978. <laughs> so I'd like to say we thank you again that you have invited us to the panel and council to come and give us an update because I love reading them. But The council as a whole, not only do we pocket books, um, uh, we support the UNCF nationally as well as individual chapters of thousands of dollars. We also support the March of Dimes, St. Jude's. You cannot think of all the artists we support. So NPHC has been a fundamental part of creating a, 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 an avenue.
so much uh, information that she shared. And as she talked about scholarship, I couldn't help but think about Alamo Promise, our last dollar. And that's what we're about, educating students. We have a moonshot, which everyone has heard about, and that's to end poverty. Our chancellor and our whole organization waged a war on poverty, and we're going to do it alone. So as we uh, begin to conclude our program, lastly, each of the students, when they gave their speech, they shared uh, what they dream of becoming one day. And we have solicited the help of some of our partners here. The Alamo Colleges. We'll share with our George Gervin students, as well as all of us, some more information. Damon John. He's a multimillionaire marketing mogul and ABC Shark Tank investor. He started showing signs of entrepreneurship early in life. He sold customized pencils to his first grade classmates. <laughs> in his late teens, John is currently worried. <laughs> Alexis, you decided you wanted to be an author. Let's talk about a famous author that we all know, Maya Angelou. She's an Amer she was an American author, actress, screenwriter, dancer, singer, memoirist, poet, and a civil rights activist. She published seven autobiographies, three books of essays, several books of poetry, and was credited with a list of plays and television shows. She was best known for her memoir in 1969, I know why the bird cage sings, which has made literary history for the in the film Georgia, Georgia. Maya Angelou had several honors throughout her career, including two, AA, uh, two AACP Image Awards in the Outstanding Literary Work for Nonfiction category in both 2005 and 2009. Her most notable quote is as follows. I will forget People will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. I have Elijah Payne who wanted to be a criminal investigator, who then said he wanted to be a kinesiology teacher. 
So Elijah, we're gonna cover both of those. James Jones, it wasn't even called that, it was called the Bureau of Investigation. And so if you look at it, you could be many different things as a criminal investigator. You could actually go into being an officer, or you also can go into the law enforcement side, or you can actually go into the law. And one of those things that got me Graduate of Harvard Law School, but one of the things he noticed is that most of us were not allowed to go to law school or any other graduate programs. So as a lawyer, he fought for rights. He fought North Carolina, South Carolina, Oklahoma, and even Texas. He fought to make sure that we had the same access as other people did, which led us to his number one most notable case which as we all know is Brown and the Board of Education, which was the notable case that allowed him and helped push him to be our Supreme Court Justice. And he She had her own college. She taught herself how to read. She was born in 1875, and she started teaching in Chicago at an institute called the Dwight Moody Institute for Home and Foreign Missions, which is now known as the Moody Bible Institute. From there, she moved to Florida, Daytona, the beach, and she started her own college, her own institute for Negro girls. It was very popular. She had about 250 girls. And then what happened is they merged with a male school called Cookman. And it became the Bethune-Cookman College. And the most interesting thing is, this is in 1904, 1920. The college is still there. There are people who are still attending that college in Florida, and it's still making an impact on that community. So something she did, thinking about as a little girl in 1880s, is still impacting us today as a community. But not only that, she was one of the first black females on a cabinet of a president. She was part of FDR's black cabinet, which was unofficially named at that time. And also, she was representing NAACP when they were coming up with the United Nations. So a lot of things we see today, she had a huge impact on. So with the teacher's heart, you can impact many people's lives here locally, nationally, or even globally. So continue on. So earlier we, we heard Dr. King's speech, Dr. King gave that speech back in the civil rights era of 1960s. And at the same time, there was a President Kennedy had the foresight to merge those two ideas civil rights, and the space. And in doing so, he invited the first African-American person to be a member of NASA and join him in getting us to space. Part of that, doing that work, 
we needed the brains of some brilliant people to help us to understand all the calculations and all the methods and all the skills that were needed to safely get our astronauts up and also to get them down. And there was calculations that need to be done. And one of those individuals who were instrumental in that calculations was Katherine Johnson. She was a Virginian student, very smart, went to high school when she was only 13, 14, graduated from high school, went on to college at 17 years old. to walk on the moon and do that work. And so, Jayden and Mackenzie, I join you as astronauts. There are only 18 African-American astronauts that have ever served in NASA. And I join you to be 21, 22, 23, and bring your colleagues along to be 24, 25, and so forth. Let's get that number into the triple digits. the first American woman to go up into space. She is one of those six African Americans out of 18 that have served in NASA. And these two women together have really some that we have here. Bernard Harris. Bernard Harris was a high school He was the first African American man to walk on the moon. So let's not forget our local talent here. And I conclude with one very special, special person. Uh, worked at NASA prior to coming to St. Philip's College serving as an educator in NASA to help to build the education sector of NASA because we can have astronauts, but we are always going to need educators. And so these individuals have been pioneers. And again, I joined, I asked you, Jaden and Mackenzie, and anyone else that you know who want to be astronauts to do the work we can. <laughs> student, Alaysia Hubbard, who mentioned that she wanted to be a music producer. Alaysia, um, I don't know if you've heard of him, it may have been before your time, but a young man by the name of Barry Gordy, who was an American record executive, a record producer, a songwriter, a film producer, and a television producer. He is best known as the founder Mosley. I read you want to be a registered nurse, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Mary Elijah Mahoney. She was the second African American to study and work as a professional trained nurse in the United States, graduating back in 1879. Mahoney was one of the first African Americans to graduate from nursing school. She received many honors and awards for her pioneering work. 
She was inducted into the Association Hall of Fame in 1976 and into the National Women's Hall of Fame in 1993. He also was a coach for Grandma State University for Redskins. So if y'all Redskins fan, <laughs> look up him. He was, you know, <laughs> I know I'm in the cowboy land, but <laughs> Redskins. <laughs> he was a Redskins, and he played the Denver Broncos, and he was the first quarterback African American to win. So I thought that was pretty good to let everybody know who was the first black quarterback. Thank you ladies so much for helping our students to hear that they too can reach their dreams. I think we have the microphones too close to, to one another. At this time, I would like to bring our staff senate president up for closing remarks and I personally want to thank all of you for coming like History Month. Students who were from the Garvin Academy, you guys did a marvelous job. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for assisting them, making it alive. You brought the dream here, so we appreciate that. And Sandra, thank you so much for assisting us, connecting us with the Greek life and why it exists. We really do appreciate that. And these wonderful co-workers, we really appreciate you all standing in the gap, assisting us, connecting several of the things, all the awards that we're receiving, and we just